Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pop Culture Politics with Gabriel MacArthur. I'm Gabriel MacArthur. Uh, before I get into the meat of the show, I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept behind pop culture politics. Uh, you know, a lot of us are steeped in politics. We pay attention to it constantly, and it can get a little heavy sometimes. So I thought it would be important to have a little bit of fun with it, do something that's a little bit light, um, and try to find the connecting tissues between the things that we like to consume, you know, with pop culture movies, books, music, whatever it may be, and look at the influences that they have on politics and the influence of politics on culture at large. Um, I saw somebody <laughs> comment that uh, Star Wars question mark. Here's the reason why I started the show with Star Wars. Number one, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the newest Star Wars movie just came out last month. So, uh, you know, it's it's in the, the pop culture zeitgeist for the time being. So it's something that people are talking about, especially one as controversial as The Last Jedi. Now, this is not a movie review. I'm not here to go into the plot details of The Last Jedi. I, I'm here to talk about the, the themes that we see throughout the Star Wars universe that largely mirror our own world. So I'm going to give people a little bit of time to jump in. Um, but the other reason why I did Star Wars is uh, I kind of like it. So let's start with something fun. <laughs> so we're going to let some people get in first, and we'll get going. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting, I'd like to see what your suggestions might be for some topics we might cover. For example... Uh, the next episode that I do next week, I'd like to cover American Horror Story Cult, which is a uh, highly political season of the show. Um, and I think it's important that with a lot of these topics that we talk about, I'm not going to go deep into Star Wars. I'm not going to go deep into uh, the history of American Horror Story, or whatever it may be. I want to find the commonalities, something that we can all understand. Uh, you know, if you've never seen a Star Wars movie before, that's okay. You get the basic idea. You know who Darth Vader is. You know who Luke Skywalker is. You know what they're supposed to represent. And, uh, you know, maybe some real-world equivalents of those people, which is something that we're going to touch on a little bit. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, my first item that I'd like to talk about, and this is the first episode of the show, so I want you all to know that this is a format that is going to be changing and it's going to be moving uh, depending on how much you folks like it. So uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is probably the, the most obvious, uh, and that is the Empire. Uh, when George Lucas initially conceived the Star Wars universe, uh, and this has been said many times since then, he conceived that the Empire was something similar to the Nazis in Germany. Um, and it, it doesn't take much to see why that is there, the aesthetic the way they dress, the way they behave. Um, so now that we have these new Star Wars movies, you have basically what is a new version of the Empire, the First Order, okay? And they're being compared to the alt-right. Basically, the people who wrote the new Star Wars movies thought, well, if the Empire were the Nazis, um, who back in, in you know the 40s and the 50s fled Germany to Argentina... Um, the, the first order in these new Star Wars movies is supposed to represent basically what would happen if those folks who fled to Argentina, uh, made a comeback, uh, which is, it's a terrifying thought in this world, but in, in the world of Star Wars, it, it makes sense. You got to keep the story going somehow. Disney's got to make their money back. Um, and then the figurehead of the alt-right, or I'm sorry, the, the Star Wars equivalent of the alt-right is Kylo Ren, who is this fanboyish, um, you know, he worships Darth Vader. So I'm not the first to make this comparison, but it could be easily said that Kylo Ren represents a lot of the folks on the alt-right who are um, a little bit younger. They, they have these conservative values that are skewing far beyond what is viewed as traditionally conservative. And Kylo Ren is a character who uh, is very angry. He's always smashing things up. He's always hurting people. Um, 
And what makes him different from a villain like Darth Vader, who did those things too, but was a lot more cold about it, a lot more cold and calm. Um, what was scary about Darth Vader was that you couldn't see what he was feeling at any given time. He's this character in this black suit and he's, uh, you know, slicing people up and he's, he's killing his own men. That's what makes him scary. But somebody like Kylo Ren who worships those things um, and his anger is so easily visible, there are a lot of similarities between people who worship the Church of Pepe, as it were, um, and the connection that they have to Donald Trump, which we'll get to a, a little bit later. So what I want to what I want you to think about is in the world of Star Wars that seems so different from ours. Um, it's it's a pretty political series if you actually look at it. The prequel movies, which people don't like, the episode one, two, and three that had Anakin when he was young, before he became Darth Vader, there were a lot of scenes that happened in the Senate, and there were a lot of scenes that happened with you know parliamentary procedure and all that. What people don't really understand about George Lucas and Star Wars is that they were always political. If you watch his movies, you know, at least every movie, there's some kind of mention of political process. And uh, George Lucas himself, the creator of Star Wars, didn't really have a lot of trust in politicians. Um, you can, I mean, there's even a line that Obi-Wan talked about. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi talked about the the emperor before he became the emperor. He's a charismatic politician. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But the next comparison I want to make is star, uh, the Jedi and the Democrats. <laughs> and the reason I make that comparison is because if you watch the Star Wars movies, especially when you watch the earlier movies, you get the sense that the Jedi are supposed to be this all-knowing, wise, uh, benevolent group of people who are there to keep peace in the galaxy. And the Democrats present themselves much in that way too. But another big similarity between the Democrats and the Jedi is the Jedi were very strict in their ways and they, they were very narrow in the way that, in what they would tolerate within their own ranks. And I'm not going to get too big into The Last Jedi, but there's a very big theme there about how the Jedi failed. And mainly what it was is that they believed so much in their own goodness that they didn't see what's happening around them. Sound familiar? The one thing that I've noticed about the Democrats throughout the past couple of years, and I'm sure it's extended way longer than that, is they think they have a monopoly on morality. They think that if you're not a Democrat, then you're not moral. Then you are not fighting on the right side. When, as many of you know, it, you don't have to be affiliated with any political party to have a, a sense of justice, a sense of right and wrong. So uh, when you see the trailer for The Last Jedi, you don't have to have seen it, but this line was everywhere. I only know one truth. It's time for the Jedi to end. Well, that's something that inspired me to really look at the state of the Democratic Party. Are they effective? Are they achieving what they say they're going to do? Do they represent this morality that they claim to represent? If you look at the news and you see this new uh, turtle mascot of Mitch McConnell, um, or even some of the ways that they vilified people who accused Al Franken of sexual misconduct, there's a lot of hypocrisy involved with the Democratic Party. And there was a lot of hypocrisy involved with the Jedi. So uh, the next big topic I want to get to, and this is probably the easiest real world equivalent because they call themselves the exact same thing. In the new Star Wars movies, the Rebel Alliance, the people who destroyed the Death Star in the older movies, they call themselves the Resistance. Don't we know another organization or another group that calls himself the Resistance? And, and here's the big difference. The resistance in the movies, they're fighting against an establishment that is much like the alt-right. They are uh, trying to dismantle the things that create a democratic and uh, 
you know, equal society. Well, the, the resistance in the movies, led by Princess Leia or General Leia, <laughs> uh, you know, they are fighting to the very last, and they understand that not all of them are going to make it out. But they believe that the hope that drives true change is worth dying for. Now, I'm not calling on anybody in our world to be willing to die for a cause, necessarily. But there are a lot of causes that I feel the resistance doesn't fight hard enough for. For example, Standing Rock. You know, if you're a resistance to, and granted, I understand that most of this was before Donald Trump won, so they weren't resisting uh, anything at that point. They should have been, but they weren't. But even when you look at uh, the way that they handle Donald Trump, it's not so much about the things that he is doing behind closed doors that really have an effect on policy. From what I can tell, it's mostly just anything that Trump has to say, we're going to put it out there as the reason why we should be supported. And that's not a resistance. That's, that's a cop-out. That's, that's taking the easy way out. In my mind, if the, the resistance of Star Wars, or at least their passion and their sense of right and wrong, were to translate into our world, when you look at the Women's March, which is coming up soon, last year, if you can remember, during the Women's March, there were a lot of uh, appointees for Trump that were getting uh, put through the Senate. Now you didn't see a lot of people showing up at senator's offices to say, do not appoint this person. We just saw basically a march with a bunch of people wearing silly hats, having a good old time. And, you know, there are other people out there that talk about how the women's march and the resistance uh, that's largely associated with it are, are not inclusive. That's not for me to say here. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of truth to that. But I think even on the progressive side of things, we know there's a lot of injustice going on out there. But we, most of the time, go back to our daily lives and go, well, I hope somebody else out there is going to take care of that. When if every single one of us said, well, who cares if somebody else is going to come along and take care of this? I've got to do something now. That is the resistance. That is what a, a resistance is supposed to be. We need more rebels out there who understand that, look, I'm going to take this position. I'm going to fight against oil. I'm going to fight for universal health care. I'm going to fight for uh, making sure there's a wide understanding of modern monetary theory. Uh, you know, if, if you were to take all of these things, and all somebody has to do to get you to stop fighting for those is to say, you might lose your job. You might lose some friends. Your family might be angry with you. If that's all it takes for you to become complacent, you are not the resistance. If all it takes is for somebody to tell you, well, yeah, universal health care would be nice, but it's just not realistic. If that's all it takes to convince you, okay, well, things are fine the way they are, I suppose. You're not the resistance. And more than that, the resistance is not just about fighting the first order or the alt-right in Star Wars. That's not just what they're about. They're about protecting the people they care about, too. So, you know, the resistance of our world seems to be a marketing gimmick where it needs to become a, a belief, an ideal, a, a code of conduct that you live day in, day out. When you go to McDonald's and you, the person in front of you is screaming at the cashier, you need to step in and say, hey, that person is just doing their job. You need to relax. Or if you have to take some sick time off because you got to take care of your kid or even yourself and your boss gives you a hard time about it. It's not easy for me to say this to you because I understand the position of 
having to survive and provide for yourself. But if you find yourself in that position, you need to tell your boss, sorry, but no. I work to live. I don't live to work. So there, there are many different ways that you can embody what the resistance is supposed to be. And what I can tell you right now is the resistance of Star Wars is probably a better model than the resistance of planet Earth. And the last topic that I wanted to talk about uh, before I kind of open it up for a wider discussion is the Emperor, the big bad of Star Wars. A lot of people think Darth Vader, especially if you haven't watched the movies, a lot of people think Darth Vader is the big bad. He's not. He's really the lackey of the big bad or the emperor. And in the original movies, you didn't really know who this person was. You just knew he pulls the strings and he's a bad dude. A lot of people make comparisons between the emperor and political figures all the time. I've seen comparisons between you know, the emperor and the pope. I've seen comparisons between the emperor and probably every president since that movie came out and I don't know, 80, 83, I think it was. So uh, there was a line in, I think it was the second Star Wars movie uh, where they were talking about the, the emperor. He was initially basically the president of the galaxy's government. And they said, you got to be careful with this person because he seems to be able to move with the passions of the people. Well, nobody, nobody does that better than Donald Trump. Um, now, there, the big difference there is that the emperor was a lot more subtle, I guess we'll say. <laughs> but um, Trump is basically the, the same thing. He knows how to put his finger on the pulse of anger that exists in our society and is able to exploit it. Now, we talked earlier about Kylo Ren and how he's this angry person who looks at the past and he doesn't know what to make of it and he, he wants to uh, take back whatever he thought he lost. You know, the, the alt-right in a nutshell. Uh, those two things go together uh, perfectly. Somebody who's able to exploit anger and pain and someone who has all this anger and pain and doesn't know how to channel it into something that's constructive and helpful for society at large. So um, I wanted to keep this first episode kind of short. So I want to open up the very end of this to suggestions, comments, questions that you may have, um, you know, Star Wars shout outs, whatever it might be. Uh, if you have any suggestions or tips, for topics, please let me know. <laughs> I just saw, just to say, just to, to, to address this here too. There were a lot of people that were talking about how Disney sucks and the last Jedi and all that stuff like that. I'm not here to talk about that. There, there is a political aspect of this, I suppose, is that in that, you know, Disney basically is going to be the majority of movies that you go to the theater to see. So they're going to be able to negotiate prices with theaters in a way that they never have before, which when you're talking about these big theater companies like AMC or whatever it might be, I'm not really as sympathetic to that, but you have these smaller theater owners. And this was a big story when it came to The Last Jedi. Some small theater owners didn't even show it. And that meant that people living in their area had to drive hundreds of miles in order to see it. But the main reason why is Disney was dictating to these theaters how much they had to pay for the rights to, to show it. And it was just too expensive, especially when you have one or two screens. So there is a political aspect to the Disney part of it. But when it comes to the content and, you know, I'm not here to convince anybody that they should like the new Star Wars movies or they shouldn't like the new Star Wars movies. I don't really care about that. What I care about is the connections that this mythos has to our real world. You know, there's a Jedi religion. There are whole scores of people that uh, basically live their lives according to what George Lucas set out to create. So it's a lifestyle for a lot of folks. And I'm a big Star Wars fan, maybe not that big, but um, there's a lot to goldmine in there. So even if you yourselves are watching Star Wars or you're, you know, you have a friend who's really into Star Wars, 
especially friends who are really into Star Wars and don't really think or talk about politics. That's a sure in to get them to understand progressivism. And especially if you watch The Last Jedi, it's a progressive movie. I, I, you know, you could say that Disney is this big corporate entity and there's no way they're going to be anti-capitalist. They figured out a way to do it with this latest Star Wars movie. So, you know, just for that alone, I suggest that you watch it. But um, Star Wars is everywhere. We know, if you're not into it, you know people that are. So use it as an opportunity to have, strike up a political conversation. Um, if there's nothing else you gain from this video, at the very least, try that. All right, so let's uh, look at some comments here. I saw some suggestions for talking about climate. Um, you know, looking at movies like 2012, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, that might be valuable. I don't know if I could do any one of those movies by themselves, but you know, a combination of them might be might be a good topic to uh, to go for. Talk about the documentary How to Start a Revolution. Well, looks like uh, I've got some homework. I'm gonna have to watch that, and uh, it might be something that we talked about. I always wondered why the emperor, if he had all that money and all that power, couldn't go to a dentist and get his teeth fixed. That is the important question in the Star Wars universe. Talk about chemtrails issue. Well, I'm sure that those X-Wing and TIE fighters aren't exactly putting out climate-friendly emissions, but in the real world, I, that's not a topic I really know all that much about. How can the party that gave us fracking and tar sands oppose the pipelines? That is a big question. Um, how can, like, and just to tie that in with the topic, the Star Wars, you know, the Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> the Jedi Code, basically, I'm not going to cite the whole thing because I don't remember the whole thing. But basically, it's like, don't be emotional, be logical, you know, be compassionate, but don't give in to fear or, you know, basically, they were teaching people to be monks. And you and I are not monks, okay? But um, when it comes to the, the similarities between the Democrats and the Jedi is uh, you say one thing and you do another. You know, Obi-Wan Kenobi had this line in The Revenge of the Sith. That's the, that's the movie where Darth Vader is born, basically. He says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Sith is what Darth Vader is, the bad guys. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. When their very code is full of them. So uh, when a Democrat says we need to be the resistance, but then on the other hand, they say, well, we need to be centrist. We need to be bipartisan. Those ideas do not connect. The Democratic Party doesn't need to be the bridge between conservative and liberal. It needs to be liberal. <laughs> um, so... In any case, that's we could go on all day about how the Democrats and the Jedi are very similar. Although I would say that the Jedi are probably the kind of people I'd rather hang out with. Sorry, I'm just saying. Democrats like Chuck Schumer, Pelosi, Feinstein, Biden, and so many more are neoliberal through and through. Window dressing. Now, that's true, but uh, I haven't confirm this. I basically just saw this uh, as a tweet from Mike Sanato, but basically Claire McCaskill was the deciding vote that killed the the efforts to uh, strengthen net neutrality. It was a Democrat who, and I'm not going to say killed net neutrality. I'm, I don't think it's ever going to be truly dead, but put it in hibernation, that's for damn sure. And it's interesting because there's a line in The Last Jedi, this is not a plot point, this is well known. It was a Jedi who trained Darth Vader and ultimately lost the galaxy to the Empire. Um, I could be cherry-picking, but, you know, there's definitely some similarities there, too. To be moral, we have found is anything but Democrat. Okay, I'm going to push back on that slightly, okay? <laughs> Only a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> there are good people from every stripe. Yeah, Qui-Gon Jinn. There are good people in every walk supply. There are good people in every political party. I would argue, you know, 
there's probably not a good neo-Nazi or KKK member, but there is the potential for them to denounce that lifestyle. We've seen it. There is always the potential for somebody to turn to the light side, as it were. Um, and that's important too, right? It's easy to say all Democrats are bad or all Republicans are bad or whatever it might be. You and I both know that's not true. You got to take it by a case by case basis, you know, especially when it comes to MMT. This is something that's important to us here at Real Progressives. It can be frustrating sometimes, especially when it's just it's almost like a mindless thing to go out and say our tax dollars, you know, our tax. dollars. It's just an easy thing to say. And people do. It's not easy to push back on that and say, well, actually, uh, you know, federal taxes don't fund spending. Um, you're going to get pushback. And as frustrating as it might be, when you're trying to have a debate or persuade somebody to understand your political thinking, you're not always going to be able to convince them. But you have to go into every one of those interactions like they could, like there's a possibility. Because I guarantee you, if you feel like the majority of people are just asleep, they're sheep, they're never going to wake up, that might be true. But you certainly aren't going to wake anybody up with that attitude. So use the, the light side. Don't go to the dark side. Don't ever believe that people are not capable of change. Some people are not capable of change, but don't ever allow yourself to believe that nobody will ever change. So I know that was a bit of a uh, bit of a tangent there. I want to thank you all for coming in. I know it was a bit of a short uh, stream. Uh, somebody mentioned Star Trek. Now I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't know much about Star Trek. I probably I mean, there's a lot of political stuff in there too. So maybe it would be good homework for me to especially as someone who's kind of objective about Star Wars or Star Trek might be good for me to check it out. Um, I think most Trekkies from what they've told me is that the Trek universe is a progressive universe for the most part. So, um, you know, it might be good if for no other reason than to get the roadmap from here to where we need to be. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, please leave comments, share the video, uh, make sure to follow real progressives, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. That's sacrilege. The sacrilege on a Star Wars. Just letting you know. But i I got to show you some love. It's I'm never going to do that again. All right. One more comment. A liberal is the bridge between the right wing and progressives. In, you know, practically speaking, I would say so. But anyway... Take care, you beautiful people, and have a wonderful Tuesday.